Thank you very much. Let me thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Byrne and, and my friend uh, also from Virginia, the Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Scott, for inviting me to be a participant in this today. This is very important to the constituents in my district. I represent the, the part of the hot spot that was mentioned earlier is southwestern uh, Virginia, and it is important. Mr. Hairston, uh, you, I, I believe I heard you say that you got help from Washington Lee University School of Law. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, as a proud alumnus of that institution, I'm glad to know they're doing some good stuff. I, they do, it's a good school and they do yes, some, they a do. lot of good things. They do a good lot. And I have heard the same thing that you said and your answers to uh, Representative Scott, to Chairman Scott were the same as I've heard in the district and that is people are afraid to go get the x-rays for fear that, that they will, there be some other reason that they lose their job. So I, I'm in, intrigued because I want to find answers to this problem. I mean, I'm, I'm a big supporter of coal mining, but I want to make sure we take care of our miners. Mr. Watsman, you indicated that we should have a, a universal uh, x-ray system. Do you think that might solve this fear problem? I mean, if everybody has to do it, and I will tell you, it, it's not an alien concept because my mother was a school teacher. And I forget how many year, years it was, but every three or five years, she had to go and get a chest x-ray for make sure she didn't have tuberculosis because there was at one time a huge tuberculosis problem. So what seems to be the resistance to having everybody get an x-ray uh, every so many years, and then that way you've got a better chance of being able to help people quicker. And it's not that somebody like Mr. Harrison would be asking for the x-ray, everybody had to get it. And I, Mr. Roberts, I want your comment on that too. But Mr. Watsman? Well, that's what we believe should be the case, that every minor participates in the mandatory x-ray surveillance program. Um, will that address the concerns of discrimination and getting fired? I, I don't know the answer to that. What I do know is that that will provide information to the minor and to the employer so that they can work with them during the remainder of their working career to protect their health as best as possible. And I appreciate that. Mr. Roberts, your thoughts, because I, I don't have an opinion per se, I'm just trying to learn here today. Thank you. Uh, my view of this, and I believe that uh, this would be the correct view, we do not necessarily have a problem with minors getting x-rays every five, six, whatever it might be years. Our problem is that we do not think that coal companies should be privy to that information. We have a HIPAA law that says that no one can have my medical records, and we're going to say to the coal companies who've got a less than stellar record in some instances here, right. here, here you go, here's the x-rays from the people who are working. That's going to, that is going to be something that minors will resist to no end. So I, I think we need that. to protect their privacy here. And, and I, I'm going to look forward to thinking about that and trying to figure it out because I also know that, that sometimes the minor, even if he has a problem, won't exercise his rights for the same fears that he didn't get in the x-ray for now. The other thing I thought was intriguing today, Mr. Watson, was this, this idea of the personal, um, let me see if I got it right here, the personal protective devices. I mean, I, I've got research from Virginia Tech that, and some researchers there have been working on it and they agree with the silica issue, but they think there may be other uh, factors as well and every mountain's a little bit different and there are different minerals in every mine and sometimes even the mines that aren't in Appalachia have high concentrations of minerals. But if we had a personal uh, protection device, it seems to me, if, if that's not too heavy or burdensome, uh, that that would eliminate a lot of these concerns about whether it's, it's coal, which we now think is not as bad as the silica, and I think that's right, based on the science, and yet there are these research ongoing about other things. Uh, what, you've, you've said that's a good idea. You think the industry would accept that? They're in, in selective instances, they're already being used voluntarily in the industry. Okay. These are so devices. Your is yes, because I'm running the out of time. The answer is yes. Mr. Roberts, what do you think? Do you think the miner would be willing to do that? Because to me, that seems like a really practical solution. It really depends on your job, Congressman. And, and let me give you an example, yes, if you sir. don't mind. I ran a shuttle car in about 40 inches of coal, and you could touch the top as you ran up to, went up to the, the miner to get it loaded. When you came back, you couldn't see anything on the other side because the coal was dragging on the top. You cannot put a shuttle car operator in an Airstream helmet and expect him to operate that shuttle car safely without running over top of somebody. If you're uh, in uh, it's other occupations in the mine, you cannot wear an Airstream helmet. It's impossible. There are some places you can, but in a lot of places you can't. Well, and maybe we need research to figure out how to make those, those devices a little bit less intrusive. 
Uh, I will also tell you that one of the things that my tech folks said we might want to take a look at is, Virginia tech folks said we might want to take a look at is uh, the, the mine processing, getting the mine ready, because apparently the dust rules don't apply until you're actually mining the product, and yet you're digging through a lot of rock to get that, that seam ready to be mined. I, I'm out of time, so I yield back. 